Praise the Lord. We are sought to prepare ourselves in prayer for the Bible study tonight. You want to commit yourself to the Lord in prayer that the Bible study tonight will reach you at the point where you are spiritually. And that the Lord will extray, expose your heart, your life, your spirit, your attitude, your character to you. And then make you to have the heart, the mind, to have the right and the proper direction and transformation in your life. Pray to the Lord and say, Lord, find me out today. Search me out today. And Lord, reveal my heart to me. The heart is deceitful. And desperately wicked, you can know it. I, the Lord, try the race, and I search the hearts, so that I can reward everyone according to his works. Tell the Lord, the God of knowledge and truth, that you will reveal the truth of your heart, your life unto you. And as it does, it will help you to make the proper correction and have the thorough cleansing in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with Him, with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Pray that the Lord will help you to discover the efficacy and the power, the cleansing virtue in the blood of the Lamb. So that I'll cleanse you, make you clean, righteous, pure, and holy. And prepare you for the coming of the Lord. That if there be in your life anything God hates that you too will discover it and hate whatever God hates in your own life you'll not toy you'll not play you'll not embrace you'll not love you'll not desire you'll not appreciate anything that God hates in your life With earnestness, promptness, you get rid of those things that will not please the Lord in your life. That you'll not remain a baby Christian, but you'll be a real disciple, growing disciple, mature disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, having your mind, your eyes, your focus on the Lord. That your will will be swallowed up in the will of God. There will be that absolute surrender, total yieldedness unto the God of heaven. That the glory due his name you will give unto him. The honor and the majesty due unto him you will give unto him. And the Lord will see your life, your spirit, your heart, your attitude, your action, your behavior. And the Lord will be pleased with you. Tell him to get rid of anything displeasing unto him. So that he'll, he'll say, I found a man, I found a woman. I found a boy, I found a girl. After my own heart. So that your life will be so pleasing unto the Lord. It will perform the great work of grace in your heart. So you begin to live a gracious life, beautiful life, holy life, righteous life. A life that attracts other people to the Lord.
pray you'll not just be a religious church comer, church goer, but you'll be a sincere, converted, transformed child of God. And the pleasure of the Lord you will do. Touched by Christ. Transformed by Christ. You live that life that reflects the grace of God and the touch of Christ in your life. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study. Thank you for your love and thank you for your spirit, spirit of truth. Always guiding us into your truth. Tonight, we come again, Lord, and we're asking, Lord, speak for your children as well as your servants. We're hearing you in Jesus' name. Whatever is not right in any heart, in any life. And whatever is not a kind of, is not a pleasure to you in our lives, Lord, point everything out. Search everything out. Show us, Lord, where we've gone astray and bring us back to the very center of your will in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you do a cleansing work, a transforming work in our hearts that, Lord, at the end of the study, we'll be clear, we'll be purer and holier than when we came in Jesus' name. We we'll remember our brothers and sisters all over this nation and all over this continent of Africa and beyond Africa. Lord, we pray as we're speaking to us, we'll speak to every one of them to you in Jesus' name. And we we'll pray that you so prepare us for the coming of the Lord that when that day will come, Every virtue and every characteristic you want to see in us will be present there, mature, complete there, that will be qualified to go in the rapture in Jesus' name. Be glorified in every life, Lord. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. We can sit down. Thank you for coming to the Bible study. It's always a joy to see those who come regularly. And those who are just joining us, maybe you have not been chance to be coming regularly, but you are here today. We we'll welcome you too. And we pray that our study together will benefit everyone in Jesus' name. We're looking at Daniel chapter 5 tonight, and we're looking at just three verses of scripture. We're looking at verse 22, verse 23, and verse 24. We're looking at Daniel chapter 5. Please open your Bible with me from verse 22. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought the vessels of his house before thee. And thou and thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, thou wast not glorified then. That means, therefore, was the part of the hand sent from him. And this writing was written. We have been following the story of Belshazzar. We have seen his action. We have seen his lifestyle. We have seen the blasphemous thing that he did. We have seen the profanity, the idolatry. We have seen the righteousness, the iniquity. We have seen the blasphemy that he perpetrated. And then we have seen the sweet, quick reaction of the Lord Almighty as a hand appeared and wrote on the wall. And even though he did not know the meaning of what was reaching, he became frightened, he became afraid, and his knees knocked together. 
I mean, he was looking for an interpreter. He called the soothsayers and the wise men of Babylon and those astrologers and all those people. But they could not tell the might of God. They could not reveal the might of God. And so eventually Daniel was brought in. And Daniel being not only a servant of God, but a child of God. Having the grace of God and the spirit of God. The spirit of truth in him. And having this link, interaction with the Almighty God, that God revealed Himself to him, and he also was a man of prayer. He had the gifts of the Spirit, an excellent Spirit was found in him. He came in. He was to reach the writing. He was to interpret the writing as well. And he told Belshazzar that he should keep his gift, his reward, that he had promised. He wasn't interested in any of those as rewards because he knew that Babylon was uh, to soon go up in flames and in destruction. And he also knew that Belshazzar was about to die. And therefore the gift and the reward of a dying man was worth nothing to him. Now, before reading the writing, and before interpreting the writing, he had to tell Belshazzar something. And he had told Belshazzar, described his life. Basically, it was a life of sinning. A life of blasphemy. A life of profanity, a life of idolatry, a life of belittling God, mocking God, depreciating God, and putting God on the ground, and then exalting the gods of iron, and the gods of wood, and the gods of stone. And Daniel reminded him of the judgment that came upon his royal father. When we say his father, actually he was his grandfather. But we call him the father because of the royal father. And he told him the judgment that had come on Nebuchadnezzar. And that even though Belshazzar had known all that, yet he would not humble himself. And I told him that it's because of that lack of humility. That's why the hand of God came in judgment and wrote upon the world. That's why we're looking at the message, the study tonight. The costly neglect of humility. The costly neglect of humility. If pride is a great sin, and it is. Then humility is a great virtue. And the neglect of this great virtue of humility brings a great punishment. The great sin of Beshasa was summarized in these words. And thou his son, O Beshasa, hast not humbled thine heart. Was he an idolater? Yes, because he wasn't humble. Was see blasphemous, yes, but the very reason, the ground of that idolatry and profanity and that sin and iniquity, the ground of it was pride. Thou hast not humbled thyself. Was see drunkard? And then he neglected, he overlooked the judgment of God and the commandments of God. Yes, but the ground of that, the reason for that is, is that he did not humble himself. Did he have so many wives and concubines? So yes. And the reason for that is that he had not humbled himself in the sight of the Lord. Daniel, by revelation, by inspiration, is telling us something. Whatever sin you commit, whatever profanity, and whatever blasphemy, and whatever iniquity, and whatever it is that anybody does, the very foundation of that is the lack of humility. It is pride. Exalting yourself, exalting your opinion, exalting your idea, Exalting what you like, what you want Above the commandments of God And therefore Daniel told him He said, the reason you've done what you've, you've done what you've done And the reason you've blasphemed God And profaned his name And you're taking those vessels out of the temple Out of that place And then you've drunk one with it Is because you are proud It's the pride of your heart And would you remember any time you do evil and then you are not conscious of what God himself desires and what he says. And when you really get the commandments of God to the background, and you say, I will do what I will do, come with me. The reason for that is pride. The reason for that is the lack of humility. He had enough knowledge of the existence of the true God. 
He had enough knowledge of the power and the might of the living God. He had enough knowledge of the God of heaven to compel him to be humble before the Lord. But he did not humble himself. And thou hast not humbled thine heart. Do thou knewest all this. He knew the severity of the judgment of God that came upon his father Nebuchadnezzar for his refusal to humble himself before God. He was not ignorant of his father's strange, severe, humiliating, divine chastisement. For seven years it was the burden of Babylon, and it it aroused fear and terror in the heart of everyone. How could he have forgotten so soon? His father Nebuchadnezzar, that's the royal father Nebuchadnezzar, had also kept the awe-inspiring experience on record so that everyone would learn that those that walk in pride, he, the almighty God, is able to abase. Belshazzar sinned against knowledge. And if anybody who has been reading the Bible, who has been studying the Bible, who has been hearing the message that God has been sending through us, through me and our leaders over here in our church, if anybody then will go to deliberate sin, it is not a sin of ignorance, it is a deliberate sin against the truth, against the knowledge that we know already. It is making up one's mind, saying, I know God hates this, I know God frowns at this this. I know God will not appreciate this, but who is God? I will do what I will do anyway, and damn the consequence. It's like the sin of Belshazzar. He knew the truth, and the sin he committed, it was a sin against the knowledge of the truth that he had. And if you, after hearing the word of God, will go out and still do evil, it will not be that you are ignorant. It will be that you say, I don't care what God feels. I don't care what God thinks. I don't care what God has commanded. I have the knowledge, but I'm going to sin against knowledge. And that's a terrible sin, sinning against the light. And sinning against the knowledge of the truth. Then we will find that God then rebuking Belshazzar sinned against knowledge. He did not walk in the light of the knowledge of the truth, which he knew. Those who know God's judgment upon others for their sins, and yet walk in the same sinful way, are doubly guilty. And will be punished with appropriate proportional severity. Belshazzar committed his sin of sacrilege with a thousand lords, his princes, with his wives, with his concubines. This is a sobering responsibility, a sobering thought that as a king, as a monarch, the sin of a monarch. It's a misleading sin. That is, it's a motivating sin. If the man up there can do it, who am I? Then that means I can do it. If my parents can do it, that's a persuasive sin. That's a prevailing sin. It means that if daddy can do it, then I can do it. If mommy can do it, then I can do it. The king's sin is a controlling sin. It's a compelling sin. If the king can do it, and then that means it's all right. When you're a leader, when you're a father, when you're a mother, when you're a preacher, when you're a pastor, and when you have leadership role in any in community, anything you do then becomes an example that other people want to follow. That's why it's so dangerous uh, for those of us who are in leadership uh, to ever be provoked to do anything wrong. Because when you do something wrong, the other people that are watching, the other people that are looking at you, say, a brother and so can do it, I think I can do it too. He's more mature than I am. And he, you see, has come to the faith before I did. And if he feels that that is right, then I can do it. And then it also turns the mind of our young people, of our youths, into the way of error, into the way of evil. Because they say the adult people can do that. They know the Bible. They are born again. They are sanctified. If I dear children of God, and if these leaders, those ahead of us in the adult church, if they can do that, then it means it's all right. No, child, it's not all right. Adults too backslide. 
And it's not everything that adults do that we recommend not to go back to the world. That's why we can read the Bible. A monarch's sin is a motivating sin. A parent's sin is a prevailing sin. A pastor's sin, think about that, is a persuasive sin. A captain's sin is a contagious sin. A leader's sin is a leading, misleading sin. An authority's sin, the sin of an authoritative man, is an authoritative, authorizing sin. It is both delightful and dangerous to be in positions of authority, in positions of leadership. Leaders can be saved of death unto death, or the saved of life unto life. And it is sufficient for these things. By corrupt, sinful, contagious, influential life, Belshazzar touched rebellion against the Lord. Therefore, he was punished and was cast off the face of the earth. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 28. I'm reading from verse 16. Jeremiah Chapter 28, verse 16. What Belshazzar did, he influenced others to blaspheme God. Influenced others to profane the name of God. Influenced others to belittle God. And influenced others to defile the name of the Almighty God. And that influencing other people, teaching other people, Leading other people, compelling other people to do evil is a great, great sin in the sight of the Almighty God. In Jeremiah chapter 28, I'm reading verse 16. Therefore thus says the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee off the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. Do you see how serious that is? Chapter 29 of Jeremiah. I'm reading verse 32. Jeremiah 29, verse 32. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will punish Shemaiah, the Nehelamite, and his seed. He shall not have a man to dwell among these people. Neither shall he behold the good that I will do for my people, says the Lord. Why? Because he has taught rebellion against the Lord. Well, you see then, leading other people to sin, leading other people to backslide, is a very serious thing. As pastors, as parents, as leaders, we must take heed to our ways, lest we receive the greater condemnation. We're dividing the study tonight to three parts. Number one, the damnable neglect of humility. When we neglect humility, when we act as if humility is neither in the Bible nor in the dictionary. When we act as if humility does not exist anywhere. When we act as if we don't even know, we don't recognize, we've never heard of humility. And we live our lives independent of humility. The damnable neglect of humility. Number two, the deliberate naughtiness of the haughty. The haughty does the proud. And the deliberate naughtiness. You know what Belshazzar did? That was deliberate. That, that's, that wasn't. If somebody wanted to drink wine, how many people have drunk wine in the Old Testament? Although they were judged for being drunk, but even to drink wine, that's bad enough. And then to go ahead and take the holy vessels, the sacred vessels, the separated, sanctified vessels of the house of the Lord, and use that to drink the wine, that's deliberate naughtiness of the haughty. And it was judged for that. Number three now, the desirable nurture of humility. That is, here is humility. We're looking at humility like a plant, tender plant that is planted in our soul, planted in our heart. And we nurture that. And we build that up. And we put manure around it. And we encourage it. And we pour water on it. And we practice it. And we deliberately nurture that humility so that our lives be humble before the Lord. I come to number one. Number one, the damnable neglect of humility. We're looking at Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. And I'm reading from verse 22. 
damnable neglect of humility. In verse 22, and thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. All the story that Daniel rehearsed and reminded him of, he said, you knew that before. The sin of your father, you knew that before. And the heavy punishment and strength punishment that came on him, you knew that before. And I was driven to the forest because of insanity. You knew that before. And now seven seasons, seven years passed over him. You knew that before. And how he then humbled himself. And then he proclaimed and wrote to all the nations and languages and tongues. And he told everybody that they that walk in pride is able to abase. You knew all that before and in spite of your knowledge you still will not humble yourself. The damnable neglect of humility. Belshazzar said, not through ignorance but through deliberate contempt of God. Notwithstanding the striking warning given through his father's case, yet he humbled not his heart before God. The sin of children are more grievous and heinous if they tread in the steps of their parents' wickedness, though they have seen how painful and pernicious the consequences of it had been. Belshazzar should have kept Nebuchadnezzar's humiliating punishment constantly before his mind's eyes as a permanent signpost warning him of the dangerous consequence of the contempt for God, of contempt for God. We too should learn valuable lessons from past experiences of proud sinners. We ought to learn the virtue of humility from the past events of men's lives, events which teach us what God approves and what God disapproves. Now he tells us, open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 10, I'm reading verses 6 and 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're looking at verse 6, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 6, now these things were our examples, the things that happened, that happened to Pharaoh, that's an example for us, that happened to Kael, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, that's an example for us, the things that happened to Absalom, to Jezebel, to Nebuchadnezzar, to Belshazzar, to Herod, all those things are examples that we should not lost after evil things, as they also lost it. In verse 11, now all these things happened unto them. For examples, and they they are reaching for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Whatever the temptation, whatever the provocation may be, we shall seek grace and divine help from God to avoid the cause which brought others under God's displeasure and wrath. Whatever is happening, it's like if you see fire here, that fire represents the wrath of God, the indignation of God, the judgment of God. And then somebody is provoking you to jump in, you say, no, you're not going to allow the provocation of anyone, the pressure of anyone, the temptation of anyone to make you rush into the fire. That fire is the judgment of God. And there's a certain lake of fire that burns and burns and burns forever. And you don't want to any provocation of anyone to push you into that eternal fire, the eternal lake of fire. Therefore, whatsoever the temptation may be, whatsoever the provocation may be, we should not see, we should seek the grace of God and the help from God to avoid the cause that brought others under God's displeasure and wrath. We must not forget the judgment that came of Pharaoh. The judgment that came on Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and that company. The judgment that came upon Absalom, that came upon Jezebel, that came upon Nebuchadnezzar, that came upon Belshazzar, that came upon Herod. And why did the judgment of God come upon those people? It was because they forgot humility. In fact, Pharaoh did not know any kind of humility. Either he spoke about God or spoke to the children of Israel or spoke to his own people. There was no iota, no grain of humility in his heart, in his life. And the judgment of God came because of that. Let's look at the experience of this man, Pharaoh 
Korah, Absalom, Jezebel, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Herod. I'm looking at Exodus chapter 5. Exodus chapter 5. I'm reading verse 2. And see the expression of his pride. The expression that lacks humility. The total absence of humility in the life, in the speech, and in the character of Pharaoh. Let's look at that in Exodus chapter 5 verse 2. Exodus 5 2. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. You can see the language, so proud and pompous, bragging, boasting. I don't know that God. Don't tell me about that God. I'm not going to let Israel go. You know how he suffered for it. I perished in Red Sea. We're looking at Korah and his, and his company. In Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16, I'm reading from verse three, one, 1 to 3. And now Korah, the son of Ezer, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, and the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses was certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown, men that were popular, exalted men, men of position and authority in the land of Israel. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. See how they were talking to Moses as if he was their equal, as if he was their slave, their boy, their servant. But you see, it shows their pride. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, and Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray you, ye sons of Levi. And then you come to verse, you come to verse, um, uh, come to, let me continue to verse, from verse 9. Seemeth it a small, but a small thing unto you, that the Lord of his, the Lord God of Israel has separated you from the congregation uh, of, uh, of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto he, unto them. And he has brought thee near to him and all that, all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, was thee. Seek ye the priesthood also? Are you not happy? Are you not satisfied? Are you not contented with what the Lord has given you? Are you seeking a higher post? And is this, so to speak, a higher post to run down leadership so that you can climb on the falling body of those leaders and then exalt yourself? We're looking at verse, at verse 11, for, for which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that she murmur against him? And Moses said to call Dathan and Abiram the sons of Eliab, which said, we will not come up. You can see a kind of boldness or bold face. That kind of rebellion, that kind of evil, you can see that kind of disobedience, we will not come up. But you know, judgment came upon them, verse 31, and it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and they had opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods, and they, and all that appertained unto them, went down alive into the pit, and they had clothed upon 
them and they perish from among the congregation. You can see how God dealt with pride. And God is still the same. He says, I'm God, I change not. And if there's pride and boasting and bragging and the neglect of humility, God still does the same thing today. He has a thousand and one ways in which he can discipline and chastise and punish man or woman or boy or girl that remains in pride that will not humble himself for herself before the Lord. We we'll see the case of Absalom, Second Samuel chapter 15, Second Samuel chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 4. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, looking at verse 4, here is the case of Absalom. It says in verse 4, and Absalom said, moreover, Oh, that I were made judge in the land. This was a murderer that had gone into exile and had received mercy from David, his father, the king. And then came back to the land. And he forgot to lay about the mercy. He forgot to lay about the forgiveness. And now he said, oh, that I were made a judge in the land, that every man that has any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. I want you to notice the language. Oh, that I would be made a judge. Oh, that I will be promoted. Oh, that I will have this and have that. I want you to look at verse 10. He didn't wait for anybody to even... When the promotion was not coming. When that exaltation was not coming. And when that position is sought very well and seriously. When that position was not coming. Let's see what he did in verse 10. In verse 10, but as Salom said... Spies throughout all the tribes of Israel saying, As soon as ye hear the sound of the trumpet, then ye shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. He was waiting for somebody to make him a judge. Oh, that I were made judge in the land. But because it wasn't coming and nobody gave him the position because he wasn't qualified for any position like that, a murderer, unrepentant, rebellious, adamant sinner. Because of that, since nobody gave him, now he just got some people together and he said, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, just say, Absalom reigneth. But you know how he died? Because of pride. Because he forgot and neglected humility. That pride killed him. And these are lessons for us. We're looking at Jezebel in first time. First Kings chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 2. First Kings chapter 19 verse 2. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me. And more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. This is the Elijah that Ahab, the husband of Jezebel, feared. And Obadiah feared. And the prophets of Baal feared. This is the Elijah that God used in performing great miracles. And that woman said, now I know you are a servant of God. And the word of God in your mouth is truth indeed. This is the man that the whole nation, they exalted and they lifted up and they said, this man is the great power of God. And when he prayed and the fire came down, everybody burned and he said, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. But this woman, he said, well, you people may kind of pray see him, appreciate him. What was my business with that? And sent a message to him full of pride and bragging. Uh, but she know what happened to Jezebel, how she died. I pray you'll not die such a death. I said you'll not die such a dead. And you know, when you see the past, if, you know, if I were you, if I, you are going on a particular way, and then you find that Herod, you know, went that same way and he fell into the pit. A Pharaoh went that way, took that road and fell into the pit. And Korah, this and Abira went that way and fell into the pit. And you find Absalom going that same way and fell into the pit. And here comes Jezebel falling into that same pit. When you see the signboard, and they say, many people have died falling into this pit and falling into this pit. If you're a wise man, a wise woman, I believe you are wise. Wise enough to avoid danger. Wise enough to avoid the judgment of God. As a wise man, as a wise woman, a wise boy, a wise girl, you will not be walking the same way to perdition, the same way to destruction. You want to avoid that. 
And that's the lesson we're learning that if all these people have gone this way and they have perished in the scene of pride and arrogance and haughtiness, then we should take note and then we should not fall into the same pit in Daniel chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 30. Daniel chapter 4 verse 30. Here comes the case of Nebuchadnezzar, the case of Nebuchadnezzar. I'm looking at Daniel chapter 4 verse 30. It says the king speak and said it's not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might, by the might of my power for the honor of my majesty. While the word was in the king's mouth there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar to thee, it is spoken, the kingdom is the departed from thee. They shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the sinful field upon Nebuchadnezzar. And you see what happened to Nebuchadnezzar just because of his sin. And we have read today they bowed to Belshazzar. And you see what came upon him too. Now in Acts of the Apostles chapter 12. Acts of the Apostles chapter 12. Let's see what happened to Herod. Verse 20. And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. But they came with one accord to him, and having made blasters, the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a such day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon upon his throne and made an oration unto them and the people gave a shout saying it is the voice of a God and not of a man immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory and he was eating of worms and gave up the ghost see how he died a humiliating death, a sudden death and pass from earth and pass to hell just because of that pride. Sudden judgment came on Belshazzar because of his failure to consider and meditate on what he had seen and heard. From his father, royal father, Nebuchadnezzar, he was of the number that have eyes and see not those who have ears and they hear not the warning sound of the trumpet. A mind to think and a heart to perceive what he is. But he was thoughtless and careless. Destruction and damnation came without remedy. We can escape God's wrath. We can escape God's judgment as we humble our hearts before God. Mankind at large, they pursue the same path of Belshazzar. Princes and people in the world seem to learn nothing from the record of the calamities which have been, which have come upon others for their evil. If we value our soul's eternal destiny, we shall take heed. If we value, if we appreciate the destiny of our souls, eternal destiny of our soul, then we shall take heed to the ways of the Lord and to our ways and walk humbly before God. If God expects from the greatest of men that their hearts be humble before him, how much more does he expect humility from every one of us? Pride is always judged by the Lord, and God has not changed. We'll come to point number two. In point number two, the deliberate naughtiness of the haughty. Deliberate, deliberate naughtiness of the haughty. You know, there are people who are ignorant. They just don't know what's right from what's wrong. And they do not have any idea whether this is acceptable or this is not acceptable. They do not know, they do not have the knowledge whether this is approved of God or this is not approved of God. But if they do evil, they're still judged because ignorance is no excuse. Let's say somebody, for example, is on top of a building. And he doesn't know that if you carelessly fall down, that you're going to break your bone. And while playing on the balcony, 
that doesn't have any railing. He falls down. The law of gravity will not say, oh, poor man, he doesn't know. He's not an educated man. He doesn't know science. He doesn't know that if anybody falls down from such a height, he will injure himself. He will still be injured. If somebody did not learn how to drive, and then he went into a car, and then started it, and started driving, and speeding, and yet he's not experiencing that. Now, he would have accident, and he could die. But that, that, if he didn't know, that doesn't mean he's still going to have the accident that he ought to have. Because, you see, the laws of nature, they do not allow anybody to plead ignorance. The same thing, the law of God does not allow anybody to plead, I didn't know that, I didn't know that. If I knew that, would I have done that? Now, if the people that didn't know and yet, when they do things worthy of chastisement or punishment, they are still chastised and punished. How much more the people that knew. And he knew they shouldn't do something sinful and something that is uh, like profanity, like Belshazzar did. He knew, and yet he did it. That was the naughtiness. Let, let me show you one verse of scripture in James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And see this word, the superfluity of naughtiness. Look at it in James chapter 1. I'm reading verse, verse 21. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. That he is to be naughty, that is bad enough. To be sinful, that's bad enough. And now to go beyond being ordinarily naughty. And then going to superfluity or flowing naughtiness. That is evil. And that's what brings punishment upon people. When you know what's wrong. When you know what's not acceptable. When you know that this is the commandment of God, and yet with a kind of adamant, determined nature and heart. And then you say, let what will come, come. Let what will happen, happen. And let whatever judgment God will bring, let him bring the judgment. It's like a man that is going on the way and is doing something wrong. And there's a law enforcement agent there, a policeman right there. And the fellow says, who cares? I'm going to show that policeman that I don't care for whether they are there or not. And he sees that in their post of duty, and in spite of that, he still continues and he does what he will do. Of course, he'll be arrested, and he's going to face the judgment and the sharp edge of the sword of the law. The same thing with the Almighty God. When you know that this is wrong, and you know that God has eyes to see, and God is watching. And yet, right there, underneath the very eyes of the Almighty God, you still do whatever you want to do. The superfluity of naughtiness. That's why the judgment came upon Belshazzar. And you know, people who are like that, in fact, God says, God has a language for them. He says, they make their hearts like adamant stone. And they harden their hearts. They stiff on their necks. And they just act as if they are not hearing. The Bible says they are like the deaf adder. That is a snake, a serpent, that is totally deaf to the charming of the charmer. And will not budge, will not move. Even though he knew that danger is near. That's exactly the description of Belshazzar. Let's look at Daniel chapter 5 once again and see that kind of naughtiness, that kind of superfluity of naughtiness, that kind of hardness of heart, knowing the word of God and the warning of the judgment to be avoided, and yet not avoiding that. Daniel chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 23. But has lifted up thyself, 
against the Lord of heaven. And they are brought the vessels of the house of his sons before thee. And thou and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways thou hast not glorified. Then was this part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. Do you notice something there? And if I, that's the first line of verse 23. But has lifted up thyself, lifted up thyself against the Lord. That's terrible. Against the Lord. Lift it up yourself against the Lord. Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2. We're looking at verse 4. Habakkuk chapter 2. Reading there in verse 4. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. His soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. Whenever you lift up yourself against the Lord, against the word of the Lord, against the doctrine of the Bible, against the teaching that the Lord is teaching his people, whenever you lift up yourself in pride, in haughtiness, in arrogance, and then you exalt your own idea above the teaching, the exaltation of the word of the Lord. The Lord says you are like Belshazzar, and that is evil. A soul that is lifted up in him is not upright. Look at Second Chronicles chapter 25. Second Chronicles chapter 25. Uh, by the way, have you noticed that after Daniel even said everything that he said? Have you noticed that Belshazzar did not pray? Have you noticed that he didn't say, what will I do? Have you noticed that Belshazzar did not repent? Have you noticed that he just, okay, that's the interpretation, that's all right. But I'll fulfill my promise. The man was going to die. I'll fulfill my promise. Clothe him. I'll put the scarlet on him. You see, that's the attitude of the people. They hear and they will not obey. They hear and they will not repent. They hear and they will not turn. They hear and they will not yield themselves unto the Lord. And because of that, adamant, arrogant, proud, haughty nature... That's the reason why that judgment comes upon them and the Bible says there is no remedy. And let's look at Second Chronicles chapter 25 verses 19 and 20. Second Chronicles chapter 25 verse 19. Thou sayest, Lo, thou wast meeting the Edomites and thine heart lifteth thee up to boast. Because you said, look at what I've done. Look at what I've done. You know, some people say, look at my achievement and look at what my success and look at what I've got. I didn't pray. I didn't depend upon any God. And yet I had what I wanted to have. He said, because you have smitten the Edomites, your heart lifts you up. That's a terrible thing. The superfluity of naughtiness because of that pride. Look at Ezekiel chapter 16. We're looking at verse 50. Ezekiel chapter 16. And we're in verse 50 there. And they were haughty. That's a terrible, terrible testimonial against them. A terrible testimony, a terrible witness against them. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. He said, the reason I brought my judgment upon them and exterminated them and wiped them out of the face of the earth and cut them off is because they lifted up themselves. They were haughty and they committed abomination before me. We're looking at Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. Here you'll find 
inside the personality. That's the coming antichrist. The king of fierce countenance. He also will manifest that kind of haughtiness and pride and bragging and boasting. And it is that pride and arrogance, that haughtiness that will be his undoing. Let's look at Daniel chapter 11 verse 36. And a king shall do according to his will. And he shall exalt himself. And magnify himself above every god. Think about that. And, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. And shall prosper. Shall succeed. Shall move on. Shall make progress till the indignation shall be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. It says, this Antichrist. It says, this king of fierce countenance. It says, this blasphemous personality that is to come. It says that he will brag, he will boast, he'll exalt himself above the most high God. And yet it says his end shall come. Look at verse 37. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. For he shall magnify himself above all. Uh, that's the height, the peak of pride. And yet, at that height of pride, at that peak of pride, the judgment of the Almighty God will come. It always comes. It always comes to anyone that boasts and brags and exalts himself, that will not humble himself and lower himself in the sight of the Lord, that, not, that will not walk humbly with his God. Let's look at the result in verse 45. Verse 45, And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain, yet, yet, yet. He shall come to his edge, and none shall help him. So you find the judgment will come. Perdition, damnation will come. Because of that haughtiness that is not repented of. We're told in Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. And we're reading from verses 18 and 19. Proverbs 16, verse 18. Pride goeth before what? Tell me out loud. If somebody could have told Pharaoh, Pharaoh, you're walking on the path that leads to destruction. But you know all his, all his people, nobody told him. If somebody could have told Nebuchadnezzar, no, they didn't tell him. All they say is, King, live forever. King, live forever. If somebody could have told Belshazzar, but they didn't tell him. All they said is, King, live forever. They just flattered them until they perished. But the word of God says, Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3, this pride and haughtiness manifests itself. In different ways, sometimes manifest in the speech, in the way you talk and what you say. Sometimes it manifests itself in action, in the way you act and the way you behave. Sometimes it manifests itself in appearance, the pride, the haughtiness, the self-exaltation. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 3 verse 16. Moreover, Say, the Lord says, because the daughters of Zion are what? They are what? Haughty. They are proud. And walk with stretched forth necks. And wanton eyes walking and mincing as they go. And making a tinkling with their feet. You know, there are people today, they say, we don't talk about these things. But God talks about them. And because God... God emphasizes them. That's why a preacher of the word that is faithful to the word of God will emphasize it. Have you noticed that many, there are many churches in the land, they just pick and choose. 
They don't study continuously and consistently from verse to verse, from chapter to chapter. Because if they do that, they might meet a particular verse that they don't want to talk about. They might meet a particular chapter they don't want to talk about. So they cannot go from chapter to chapter, but they hop like grasshopper and hop out of this and hop into this and hop into this. And they jump over some important passages of scripture. Especially the things that knock at the very root and the head of their pride and superfluity of naughtiness. In verse 16, moreover, the Lord says, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and walk will stretch forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and missing as they go, making a tinkling with their feet. Therefore, the Lord will smite with his cap the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion. And the Lord will discover the secret parts. In that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their cords and their round tires like the moon, the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers and the bonnets and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings and the rings and the nose jewels and the changeable suits of apparel and the mantles and the wimples and the crisping pins and the glasses and the fine leaning and the hoods and the veils and it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell there shall be a stink and instead of a gradual range instead of well set air boldness and instead of a stomach there will be a, ga a garden of sackcloth and burning instead of beauty and if you see what people do today in the name of beauty just because of their pride and God says he's going to bring judgment upon such people I pray God will protect and protect serve us from such judgment in Jesus name give me a good good amen, amen. but just as sin illustrates the superfluity of naughtiness to sin ordinarily is bad enough but to make others sin is the height of wickedness to regard iniquity in the heart is to undivine divine displeasure but to warn to them that draw iniquity or the courts of Vanity. To do evil is to come under condemnation, but to do evil with both hands earnestly is doubly damnable. To rebel against God exposes man to punishment, but to teach others rebellion against God invites the rushing whirlwind of divine wrath and punishment. Ignorant sinners shall be punished. How much more will defiant sinners, deliberate sinners, sinners, determined sinners, hardened sinners, who sin under the bright light of the knowledge of the truth, how much more will they be punished? It says, for as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. They are without excuse. Belshazzar was without excuse. And we who are here, we who are listening to the teaching every time we are going from verse to verse, chapter to chapter of the Bible, we too were without excuse. We know what God demands. We know what He desires. We know what He condemns. And we are to walk humbly with our God. God. Belshazzar's sin was a great affront against God. It was a great provocation, a great insult, a great offense. He had thrown all restraint away and had sinned with impunity, going beyond the horrifying abominations of Nebuchadnezzar ever practiced. When you think about what Nebuchadnezzar did and what judgment came upon Nebuchadnezzar, you say, but Nebuchadnezzar went to the very height of sinning, and yet Belshazzar went beyond those horrifying abominations of his father. He lifted up himself against the God of heaven. He exalted himself, and he was filled with pride and haughtiness. He reveled in abomination of profanity. He said, the dead God gods made of dead metals against the true living eternal God of infinite majesty. His proud heart defied the mighty creator of heaven and earth. In his self-induced insanity, he would not recognize nor regard the God whose, in whose hand his breath was and whose are all thy ways. The indictment against Belshazzar was clear and convincing. No further proof of his 
his guilt was required, his reproof was just and justified. Even his own conscience could not plead for him. Heaven and earth had irrefutable evidence against him, and his judgment came, and that judgment was final and irreversible. I pray that God will preserve and protect us from that kind of judgment in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three, the desirable nurture of humility. What's the, what's the conclusion of everything? Everything we have seen in Belshazzar, everything we have seen of Pharaoh, everything we have seen of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, everything we have heard of Absalom, everything we have heard of Jezebel, everything we have heard of uh, Jezebel, of the Old Testament and the New Testament, everything we have seen of Nebuchadnezzar and of Belshazzar and of Herod, everything is pointing to the fact that we must humble ourselves before the Lord so that we can avoid the judgment, the calamity, the indignation, the wrath that came upon them. That's why we want to pray that God will grant us humility and then we'll not show that humility. We'll live in that humility. We'll walk humbly before our God. Let's look at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. I'm reading from verses 3 and 4. Matthew 18 verses 3 and 4. And, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children. Salvation is important. Conversion is important. The new birth is very important. It is kind of humility. It is not something you can produce just by yourself. It's not something that grows in any man's garden, the plant of humility. It is something that comes from God, that comes from heaven. That we go to the Lord in prayer, we say, Lord, I know, I know, I know how proud I am. I know how insensible, insensitive, and haughty I am. I know a little thing, a little accomplishment. I feel so proud. Oh Lord, forgive me. And in all the other sins that we have committed, we confess everything before the Lord and we repent and turn away from all those sins. And then we cling to Calvary and we cling to the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ because we cannot save ourselves. None can save himself. Only Jesus can save again. It is the pride of man. It is the haughtiness of man that feels I can save myself. I can turn over a new leaf. I can make myself better. And I can so polish my life. It will be all right and acceptable to God. Humility will make us to go on our knees and to say, Lord, I cannot save myself. I need salvation from you. I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. God, my tears forever flow and my zeal no longer. No, all these for sin cannot atone. Thou and thou alone must save. It is then as we come before the Lord, he will save us. That's called conversion. And the Spirit of God will be a witness in our heart that we are changed. We are turned around. We are transformed. Our sins are forgiven. That's what Jesus said. Except ye be converted. Now when that conversion comes, it comes with humility. We are so grateful to God and we say, God, this is not of me. This is not of me. This is of your doing alone. And then it says, and become as little children, except that happens, he shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever in verse 4, therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. When that combustion has taken place, there will be the evidence of humility. Pride is gone. Haughtiness is gone. Boasting is gone. Bragging is gone. And going your own way, all that is gone. You'll be bowing down at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're looking at uh, the people that God delights in, and the people that he, he rejoices to bless, and the people that he dwells with. Those are the people who are humble. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah 57 verse 15. In Isaiah 57 verse 15, For thus says the high and lofty one, that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. I dwell with him also that is of contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart 
of the contrite ones. James chapter 4. In James chapter 4, it tells us how God delights in the people who are lowly and meek and humble, submissive to the Lord. James chapter 4 verse 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he says, God resisteth the proud. The proud resist the word of God, and God resists them. The proud resist conviction. That is when the word of God comes out and it convicts them and says, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's not proper. They just shake their heads and shake it off. And because they resist the conviction that comes with the word of God, God also resists them. It says, he giveth grace, he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw nice unto you. Cleanse your heart, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. You see what the Lord is telling us? He wants us to be humble, to humble ourselves before the Lord. In Psalm 131, Psalm 131. In Psalm 131, Lord, my heart is not haughty. When you can go to the Lord and you can say, Lord, I can testify now. You've done something in me. It was not like that before. Oh, the bitter shame and sorrow. That the time could ever be when I let my Savior's pity plead in vain and proudly, proudly, arrogantly, haughtily answered all of self and none of thee. But Lord, things have changed now. Things are different now. My heart is not haughty anymore. In the past, yet you found me. And I beheld him bleeding on the accursed tree. I had him pray, forgive them, Father. And my wistful heart said faintly, Some of self and some of thee. And that's the man saying, I cannot surrender everything totally to the Lord. I have God have some of his way. And I will have some of my way. Will share it 50 50, some of thee and some of me. And that was still pride. But he has not come to the testimony of Psalm 131 yet. But the Lord kept on walking on him, pleading with him, and, and exhorting him, and, and, and drawing him, and day by day, his tender mercies, healing, helping, full and free, sweet and strong, and as so patient, brought me lower while I whispered less of self and more of thee. And God said, that's still not enough. You give me about 70% and you take 30% yourself. I will not share my glory with any man. And eventually, he said, higher than the highest heavens and deeper than the deepest sea. Lord, thy love, thy pleading and thy sacrifice at last has conquered my proud heart. Grant me now Oh, my supplication, none of self, zero for self, and all of thee, a hundred percent for thee. That's then you can come to Psalm 131 and bear the testimony, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty, neither do I exercise myself in greater matters or things too high for me. I pray the Lord will bring us to that position. Where we can seriously tell the Lord and say, Lord, self is gone. Self is dead. Now all the glory belongs to you. That's what the Lord wants and that's what we're going to have. Without humility, the sinner cannot have genuine repentance or salvation. And will not seek God for the salvation that comes through the atonement of Christ. Being saved 
we can only remain saints as we walk humbly with God. The servant cannot be above the master. The Lord Jesus Christ who made himself, who made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. It is in the humble heart and the high and the lofty one whose name is holy dwells. The habitual state of mind of every true child of God is that of one who feels that he is the object of undeserved mercy and redeeming love. He says, everything of God was given freely. By God, I merit nothing. And so there is nothing he's proud about. He knows there is nothing he has which has not been given unto him. Uh, does he have skill? Does he have talent? Does he have ability? Does he have privilege? Does he have any position? Does he have any authority? Does he have a uh, success in business or whatever? He's not proud of anything because he knows it was given to him by, by the Lord. And because it was given to him by the Lord, that makes him humble before the Lord. And look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Reading from verse 7. You know, some people are proud of their children. My children has done this. My children have, have accomplished this. That's of God. That's not of you. They are proud of their success. That's of God. That's not you. They are proud of their riches. That's of God. That's not you. And they are proud of their ability to do this or that. That's of God. That's not yourself. What have you got that God has not given you? If you realize this is an unmerited gift, undeserved favor from God, there's nothing to be proud about. In First Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7. For who makest thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory? Why dost thou boast? Why are you bragging? As if thou hast not received it. That makes us then humble before the Lord. And if you're a real child of God, you will not exalt yourself because you know that you have nothing of yourself. Everything you've got, you've got from the Lord. Why don't you look at the example of our Lord Jesus Christ? It's very instructive. If we are the followers of Jesus, we must follow after his example. See the testimony concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. High exalted on the very Son of God. And the one that came to pay the price for salvation. Let's see the testimony concerning him. His humility. His total yieldedness and submission unto the Heavenly Father. And that humility that made him to come from heaven. And it died that death on the cross of Calvary. And he made himself the servant of all. He said, I am among you or see that servant. And he said, the servant is not above his master. If we are following the master, I will follow Jesus everywhere he goes. I will follow, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. If that is so, then we're going to follow him in humility to you. In a humble spirit, in a lowly spirit, and in a meek spirit, we're following after the Lord. And we say, what will the Lord do, he will not brag, you will not brag, he will not boast, you will not boast, he will not be proud, you will not be proud, because the nature of Christ has been transferred into your heart and life. See the testimony concerning Christ in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, we're reading from verse 29. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. He said, I am meek. And that's the way we ought to be. No pride, no arrogance, and no bragging, no boasting. Just meek and quiet and peaceful and loving and lowly and humble before the Lord. We're looking at Luke chapter 22 verse 27. Luke chapter 22 verse 27. For whether is greater he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. I am among you as he that serveth. That's the example the Lord Jesus Christ has 
placed on record for you and for me, and that we should be like that and follow the footpath of the Lord Jesus Christ and be among the people of God and in our community as he that serveth. In Mark chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 36. Mark chapter 14. We're looking at verse 36, the example of Jesus, and the example he has placed on record for you and for me so that we can follow. Mark 14, verse 36. It tells us and said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. No, nevertheless, not what I will. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what Thou wilt. What causes problem in our families? Conflict, disagreement, verbal attack, violent attack. What's that? Because the husband wants to go the way he wills, and the wife wants to have her own way too. But if each one can come before the Lord and before one another and say, that like Jesus said, nevertheless, not what I will. If we can say that in small, small things that come up in the family. You know, some families, they cannot take even the minutest decision without argument. No, you've started again. No, you have started again. You want to have your way. You too, you want to have your way. Why don't we just bury that cell? And isn't that what causes a conflict in our employment, in our companies where we are? And the director will say, this is what you do. The employee will say, hey, manager, I know my baby. Don't talk down to me like that. And if you talk like that, I will also have my way. That's what causes problem. But if the believing worker can come before the Lord and say, Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt, is not what causes problem. We shouldn't have any problem in the church. If we have the mind of Christ, I have the mind of Christ, you have the mind of Christ. And then we submit to God and we submit to one another. And we say, nevertheless, not what I will. It is what I will is the pride in the heart of man that causes the problem. But if there is submission and humility, we respect one another. I respect you, you respect me. You submit to me, I submit to you. And we submit to one another. There will be no conflict or problem in the church of the living God. It's the lack, it's the absence of humility that causes the problem. Nevertheless, not what I will, but as thou wilt. In fact, you know, see the way Jesus used the word not. Nothing, nothing, nothing about himself. Uh, concern, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, the Son of God, that God said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And see the humility that he manifested and demonstrated. And that is an example for you. An example for every one of us. We're looking at John chapter, chapter 5. John chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 19. John chapter 5 verse 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself. If I could be like that, if you could be like that, and you just take the position uh, and you follow the four parts of the Lord Jesus Christ. The son can do nothing of himself. And the son will say nothing of himself. Will not be dragging one another to the leaders. He said this about me, said that about me. And you know the leader must condemn him on my behalf. Otherwise there's partiality in this place. The son can do nothing of himself. It is arrogating to ourselves a high position. And wanting to have that affirmed and say, except they support me and accept they affirm and confirm how great and important and it is indispensable I am, I am going to have my way, otherwise, I'll scatter everything here. But you know, that's not the attitude of the Son of God, and it is this humility that we need that in which, whichever place we find ourselves, in whatever service we find ourselves, we're saying, like the very Son of God, the Son can do nothing of Himself. I'm reading chapter 5, verse 30 of John. 
Psalms chapter 5 verse 13. It says, I can of my own self do nothing. It's voluntary. It's voluntary. This is the very son of God. It says, the whole creation of this world was made by him. Without him was nothing made that was made. And yet, voluntarily, he said, I can do nothing by myself. Uh, are you like that? As a Christian, as a believer, as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the humility you want to nurture. The temptation will come to assert yourself and to affirm your position and to say how great you are and to demand attention. And if they don't give you attention, to tell them and show them and prove it to them that you are Mr. Somebody. But if you can just nurture this humility and say, I'm nothing, I'm meek and lowly, I'm, follow, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And then you say, The Son can do nothing, can say nothing of him. Self, and then you say, I can of my own self do nothing because I seek not my own glory, but the will of him that sent me. Look at chapter 8 of John, verse 28. John chapter 8, verse 28. The kind of humility he wants us to have. And a kind of submission he wants us to have. And a kind of yieldedness, absolute surrender that he wants us to have. And this is the beauty of the Christian life. That our lives, our hearts are submissive to the Lord. And we're not looking for anything except His praise, except His will, except His glory. And we're not asking for the praise of man, for the appreciation from man, and for people flattering us, flattering us, flattering us every time. All we want is just for God to be glorified. Even if we have to be a doormat, the people will walk on and get into the kingdom. All we want is God to be glorified and the souls to be saved. That's the Christian life. In John chapter 8 verse 28, Then said Jesus unto them, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He, and that I do, I do, I do what? Nothing of myself. Can you say that? Can you say that? I do nothing of myself. You know, there's a devil out there that will push you from inside to do something for yourself, stand up for yourself, defend yourself, and show them you are Mr. Somebody and you are Miss Mrs. Somebody. If you don't show them, they'll be get, they'll be taking advantage of you. But Jesus said he will not do that. It's the devil that tempts you to do that sometimes the flesh, depravity in what depravity will tempt a person and stir up something from the inside, why don't you get up and kick them why don't you, don't you talk back why don't you react to them why don't you show them, don't you have some method you can use to show them they shouldn't talk to you like that or deal with you like that but Jesus said no for him, I do nothing of myself, but as my father has taught me, I speak these things all of God's children are to sincerely follow the supreme example of the self-emptying of Christ. We're to nurture the virtue of humility. God willing, we're going to do it. By the grace of God, God will keep on reminding us every day we'll nurture and develop this humility in our lives in Jesus' name. We will grow in the grace of humility. We'll be closed with humility. We'll put on humbleness of mind and daily humbly walk with our God, humbling ourselves in the sight of the Lord. This is what he desires, and this is what he wants us to have. Putting the example of the Lord Jesus Christ before us every time, and by the grace of God through prayer and faith, dependence, leaning upon the Lord, following him every step of the way. When the temptation comes to be proud, and the temptation comes to be haughty, and the temptation comes to assert yourself, you say, no, no, Christ did not do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, and as to depend upon the Lord, the grace to follow Jesus Christ absolutely without deviating, turning to the right or turning to the left. That grace the Lord will give to every one of us in Jesus' name. Ephesians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. Let, let nothing be done through strife for being glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. 
be polite to other people. And show some compassion. And show some consideration. And don't just behave to satisfy yourself. I don't care whether he likes it or not. I'm going to do it anyhow. That's not the way of the Lord. That's pride. I'm going to have my way. Whether it hurts him or helps him, that's his business. That's a sinner. That's a backslider. But a child of God will not do anything through strife or vain glory. In lowliness of mind, he will esteem other people better than himself. In verse 4, look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind in Christ, that mind will possess us from today. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I want that mind. I want that attitude. I want that disposition. I want that lowliness. I want that meekness. I want that humility of mind. Oh Lord, all the superfluity of naughtiness or pride or bragging. Oh Lord, take that away from me and help me, Lord, that I will have, I will have the humility and the lowliness and the gentleness and the compassion and the politeness lightness that I ought to manifest to other people. I'll not be thinking about what satisfies me, what I want every time. I'll not be thinking of my exalted position, be proud, be haughty every time. Oh Lord, help me that I may follow after the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ. Talk to the Lord in prayer. He'll help you. We are not of the relatives of Belshazzar. We're not of the subjects of Belshazzar. And we're not in his family. We're not in the family of Nebuchadnezzar. In the family of Belshazzar. We want to be among the people that humble themselves before the Lord. Among the people that look up to the Lord and say, Lord, I want the nature of Christ in me. The beauty of Christ in me. I want the lowly character, the meekness, the humility of Christ in me. I want to be a lowly child of God, a humble child of God, a meek child of God. I want to be a child of God that is following the Lord conscientiously and consistently. I don't ever want the nature of Belshazzar, of Pharaoh, of Jezebel, of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. I don't want the action and the speech of Absalom. I do not want the attitude of Nebuchadnezzar and the attitude of Belshazzar, neither do I want the arrogance and the haughtiness of Herod in me. Oh Lord, give me the nature of Christ. The nature of Christ. That is the nature that will make us approved of God. Tell the Lord He will do it. He loves to do that. He wants to do that. Let the word of God profit you. Let the word of God take root and take effect in your life. Let it change something in you that you'll be able to say, Thank God I listened to that word and the sword of the word has caught away the branch and the stem and the root of pride and haughtiness in my life. You see the life of Christ. If you are a believer, you'll follow after that example of Christ. If you are a believer, you'll want the grace of Christ to walk in you. You'll be able to have the same testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ in you and you in Christ. With the fullness of Christ in you. Day by day, Christ in all this lowliness and meekness and humility dwelling within you, then you'll be able to say, I am meek and lowly in heart. Follower of Christ, disciple of Christ, child of God, cleansed and washed by the blood of the Lamb. Like Jesus Christ, the same grace that was poured into his life. That same grace will be poured into your life. Then you'll be able to say, I am among you a see that serveth. I came not to be ministered unto, but I came to minister. And then you'll be able to say in every situation, every time, Father, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Uh, that's the evidence of following Christ. That's the evidence of conversion. 
self-subdued, self-crucified, self-buried, Christ exalted, Christ on the throne of your heart, Christ reigning supreme, Christ the Lord and the Master. Not what I will, but what thou wilt. As Christ said, the Son of Man can do nothing of himself. The same you'll be able to say as you receive more of the grace of God. As you dwell and rejoice in more of the nature of Christ. This is Christianity. This is what it means to follow Christ. That you'll be able to say, I can of my own self do nothing. You don't act like the unbelievers, the sinner, who have no guide, who have no doctrine, who have no teaching, who don't have the Spirit of God directing them, controlling them, leading them, and guiding them. But you act like Christ who fills your heart, dwells in your heart, abides in your heart. Are you able to say, I cannot my own self do nothing. Because I seek not my own will. I seek not my own will. In the day, in the night, in the office, in the church, on the street, in the community, in the house, on the road. I seek not my own will. There will be no argument if you are not seeking your will. There will be no contention if you are not seeking your will. There will be no strife if you are not seeking your will. There will be no complaint, no murmuring if you are not seeking your will. If you are like Jesus Christ, I cannot my own self do nothing. Because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. You'll submit to the authority of the Father. You'll submit to the gentle leading of the Spirit. You'll be like Christ. I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, your life will reflect the teaching of the Word of God on humility. When you have Christ abiding in you, Dwelling in you, reigning in you, having dominion over your heart and over your life and over your spirit. He humbled himself and became obedient. That's the life that grace produces in us. The self emptying of Christ. He made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself of the self-life. That's what you'll do as Christ reigns supreme in your heart, in your life. And his will be the glory, not yours. His will be the exaltation, not you. This will be the preeminence, not you. You'll be joyful, you'll be happy to take a lowly place because of Christ. You'll be so happy that your life is turned over to Christ. And he is now in full control. You're saved, your sanctified self is crucified and is dead and is buried and your life is only to seek the glory of God not your own glory you'll not show that virtue of humility every day every challenge that comes every day you take it to be a challenge an opportunity to nurture that virtue of humility and to grow in the grace of humility and you close yourself every time even what the proud people are kind of demonstrating their proud you close yourself with humility you'll put on humbleness of mind Daily humbling yourself in the sight of the Lord. 
You wake up in the morning, you pray to have the grace of God so you can walk consistently, humbly with your God. God will do it.